Most things in mixing aren't 100% consistent. Maybe there's stuff you do in 90% of mixes, but every now and then you do it differently. But personally, there is one thing that I do every single time I mix without failure. You ready? I prepare the mix before I start mixing. Now, I know it sounds boring, and I think that's why a lot of people skip this phase. But personally, I think it's vital and it sets you up for a great mix. So keep watching to learn what mix prep is, why it's so important and how you can do it in your next mix in just six simple steps. But first download the free mix prep cheat sheet that I put together for this video. There's a link on screen now or in the bio. All right guys, how's it going? Rob here from Musician on a Mission. Now, before I dive in and actually show you how to prep your mixes, let's talk about what mix prep is and why it's so important. The purpose of mix prep is to do as much as possible before you actually start mixing and get your static mix. Because from that moment on, you're actually in the process of mixing. You're becoming less objective every second. And if your monitors are too loud, your ears are getting more fatigued every second as well. For those reasons, I see mixing as a race against the clock. So you want to do as much as you can to give yourself a head start. So here are the six steps you can go through before you actually start mixing. Step one is organization. Just making sure all the channels have the right name, they're in the right order, adding markers, that kind of stuff. Step two is checking the tracks, making sure everything is there and nothing's corrupt. Step three is gain staging and making sure nothing's clipping. Step four is checking phase and polarity flipping where needed. Step five is applying surgical EQ where it might help. And then step six is automating the vocal or any other parts that you want to be really consistent and upfront. Now, the common theme here is that all of these things can be done in solo before you start mixing. So you're not listening to the full track yet, which means it's not starting to influence the way that you're hearing it. And I want to be clear that the goal here is to do as much as possible without making the track sound different. As soon as you start making the track sound different, well, you're going through the act of mixing. And this is a bit of a gray area when it comes to subtractive EQ, but we'll come back to that later. Okay. Let's Let's actually go through these steps now and prepare a mix. So step one is organization. We just wanna import the files or if you're already working within a project, just consolidate them down so that you don't have loads of edits on screen or 50 different vocal takes. We just wanna clean everything up, make it really easy to move around the mix. So if you're working with tracks that you downloaded online or that someone sent you like this, then you might also find they have weird naming conventions. Instead of going through and manually renaming these, you can use something like File Rename Pro, which you can get on the App Store, and using regular expression replace, which which is going to find uh, digits, for example, with backslash D, that's the regex for digits. So before it was just like this, we've got one, one, and then underscore. That's the bit we want to get rid of so that when we drop them in the door, they're already labeled properly. So we can do that by just going backslash D, which is digit, gets rid of that, underscore, and then we need the other digit there. And now you can see before it had this weird naming convention, after it, it's just clean. We can hit rename done, quit, and now that means when we drag these into our project, everything is already named. So you might wanna then go through and rename some of these so that it makes sense to you, whatever you need to do to make sure all the names are correct. Now, if you're working on your own music, you're probably not gonna be going about it this way. So what I would recommend you do is actually export the files so that you can go through that process you just saw. So you start a new project with your mix, or you can just consolidate them in the project. Because if you've got loads of different takes that you were comping and you've been editing the track, if you just start mixing in that same project, it can be really tempting to keep editing and keep playing around with stuff. So once you've done that, check the names, put them in the right order, Order. It really doesn't matter what order you use, just try and keep it consistent. So I tend to go vocals, then drums, then bass, then everything else. Once you've done that, you can add some markers. So we might want to find just the last chorus of the climax of the song because that's the best place to start mixing, just loop that. So we can add some markers in here just to that chorus, maybe some other verses, just to make it easy to move around the track. And then the last thing I'm gonna do here is just create some buses so that my group buses are ready to go. I can add plugins to the whole drum kit if I want to and that kind of stuff. So for me, this is enough, but you might have some more complicated signal flow channel routing going on and you wanna do that now, have everything done so that when you're mixing, you can just send stuff to the right place. Okay, so that's step one, just organizing everything, making sure it's gonna be easy to move around when you're mixing. Step two is to go through and check all of the channels, make sure there's no audio missing, nothing's corrupt, make sure everything's there, just look out for any potential issues. 
So it looks like everything's good here. I was worried that I was missing the vocal, but this is actually an instrumental. So we've just got this kind of weird vocal intro. And that's the kind of stuff you tend to look out for is just, are there weird clips where it looks like there's no audio or like it's been exported wrongly, that kind of stuff. Because you don't want to get distracted later on when you're in the heat of the mix and everything's going really well. And then suddenly you realize, ah, oh, shit, the snare mic's missing. It's happened to me a few times and it's always really annoying because then you have to just stop find out what happened and it's just a complete ball ache. So get that out of the way now and make sure everything's there. Step number three is gain staging. And this really shouldn't take that long. It's just the case of going through, making sure none of the tracks are clipping and adding a gain plugin if they are. So what I'm gonna do here is just go to the loudest section, hit play. I'm actually gonna turn my monitors right down. So you'll still hear something, but I don't actually need to hear it. I'm just gonna look for channels that are clipping. <laughs> So yeah, we've got a few here. Now you can go about this a number of ways. If you think you're gonna be using lots of saturation, lots of tape emulation, that kind of stuff, then you wanna shoot for that minus 18 sweet spot. If the channel is kind of sitting around minus 18 here, then that's the best level for those kind of plugins. If you don't do that kind of stuff, then the quickest way to gain stage is to just add a gain plugin to the output channels that are clipping. So here the drum bus was clipping, so I can just cut that by, five to 10 dBs and I can just copy this onto the stereo out as well. And this means none of the channels are clipping. So this kick is a little hot as well. We wanna be careful with that because if we started adding compression, for example, and we're playing with the output volume, we might end up clipping. So anything that's really close to clipping, you know, minus five or closer to zero than that, then we wanna cut a few dB on those as well. Equally same here on this guitar channel. And we can just copy that across onto the bass channel as well. So there we go, gain staging done. We've already covered a lot here and we're only halfway. So again, make sure you get that cheat sheet to actually reference and go through each of these before your next mix. Okay, now for step number four, which is checking phase and polarity. Now, I've always been really bad at this and I'll forget to flip the polarity on the bottom mic of a snare or to check the phase on a multi-mic kit, something like that. And the reason I was quite bad at this is because I thought it was more complicated than it was, but it really doesn't have to be that complicated. We just want to focus on two things here. First of all, polarity and then phase. So polarity, you just want to check that there are no mics facing each other. So if you've recorded it, you'll know that and you just want to take a mental note anyway. But if you're mixing something else, then you just want to look for snare up and snare bottom. That's the most common one. So I wouldn't call these up and down. I would call them top and bottom. Here they're called up and down. So we just need to figure out does up mean the mic pointing up and maybe we can change that name. So that's actually the snare bottom and that's the snare top. So what we want to do now is solo these and let me just give you an example because the polarity might have already been flipped but basically when two mics are pointing each other they're going to be completely out of phase and they're going to essentially start to cancel each other out. So what you want to do is just load up a plugin that has a phase flip so in logic the stock game plugin has a phase invert there's loads of plugins out there that will do this most doors will have a plugin that can do this so you just need to figure out which plugin and now i'm just going to hit this button a few times until it sounds better that's it because it might have already been inverted so i'm just going to flick this a few times This is a great example. You can actually hear it really clearly. When I don't phase invert, which means this has already been done, the snare sounds quite full and it has lots of low end. But as soon as I hit that button and flip the polarity or invert the phase, what it's doing is canceling out all of that low end and it just sounds really thin and weak and meh. Have a listen again. So this is without which means they've already flipped the phase. And this is when I flip it back to what it would normally be like. So if your snare sounds something like that, you need to invert the phase. Because it's already been done on this snare and that was probably on the preamp when they were recording it, they did that, I can just get rid of that plugin. So the next thing is to then check phase. And this is where we're not necessarily looking at mics that are directly facing each other, but mics that are gonna be slightly different distances from the same sound source. So if you've got two mics on a guitar amp, or if you've got a, a vocalist where you're recording the vocals of a mic like this, but you're also recording an acoustic guitar at the same time, which means there's gonna be a second mic that's picking up the guitar, but there's gonna be loads 
loads of bleed from the vocal if they're done together. So these two mics are gonna be slightly out of phase. And what that means is the signal going to the second mic is gonna be slightly delayed because it's had to travel a longer distance. This can cause a range of issues. To put it simply, it's gonna have a similar effect where it starts to cancel out certain frequencies and just make it sound worse. There are gonna be these big gaps in the frequency spectrum of that sound source. So here we've got two mics on the electric. I'm just gonna turn these down a touch and now let's have a listen. <laughs> So it sounds like that one might be a room mic. So they have quite a different tone. So it's hard to tell exactly what's going on here. It could just be two very different sounding mics, like a dynamic and a condenser. It could be one of them is on the back of the amp. It could be one is just on a different point in the speaker grill. But what we can do is actually check the phase with these. So I'm gonna go here. I'm just gonna zoom in really far like so and just look at the waveform because it's distorted the waveform is quite messy but i think we're just gonna have to work with it so we're focusing on these two channels here let's zoom in and we just want to look at the waveform so it looks like they pretty much line up sometimes what will happen when you zoom in is this one will be slightly out like that and if this is the case then they're cancelling each other out quite a lot you can see this dip here correlates with a peak here and because we've got a dip and a peak combining well put them together and you get zero so it's going to start to cancel out so this is what it would sound like we're losing a lot of that low end again now i'm going to move it back so that it's in line and we can just drag it like so just so that it's pretty much in line like that let's listen again So before and now after. Big difference, right? And this is something you could spend the whole mix trying to fix. You'd be like, damn, why does this guitar sound so weak? So you try EQ, you try compression, all this crazy stuff, when in reality, you just had to check the face. So this is important. You won't have to do it in every mix, but you just wanna make sure you actually remind yourself to check the face, check the polarity, and make this part of the mix prep process. That's the tough stuff out of the way. That's probably the most difficult part of this. So now we can move on to the more fun stuff. Step five, which is surgical EQ. Now, I didn't actually start doing any EQ as part of the mix prep phase until a couple of years ago, but I think it's a really great way to, again, save time when you're mixing because quite often surgical EQ, where you're just removing nasty stuff, it doesn't really make things sound different. You don't need the context there. You just wanna get rid of the noise in the low end or get rid of this really nasty resonance on a tom, something like that so that when you're mixing, you can focus on how to shape things tonally with EQ, how to make them sit better in the mix. And for those decisions, you need context. But for anything you could do in solo, anything that's a bit more objective, you can do that now in the prep phase. I find myself doing this most commonly on vocals, but here we don't have a proper vocal part. So instead, I'm just gonna scan through each of these, see if there are any major issues on the drums, the kick, the snare, the guitars, stuff that we could fix now not to make things sound different, but to kind of just remove that nastiness, remove this layer of grit that's sitting on top of them. We just want to try and clean the channels up. So we've got quite a ringy snare. We could try and find that and reduce that. You could use multiband compression to tame that, but for the sake of simplicity, I'm just gonna leave it with EQ there because that sounds great to me. And we could then tidy up some of that low end as well. So this is before, and this is after. 
So it doesn't sound different, it just sounds cleaner. And that's what we're trying to achieve here. Just make sure you're only removing nasty stuff and not necessarily making things sound different. Don't spend too long on this either. If you find that you're really going in depth with the EQ, then you're probably doing too much. It should just be a quick little subtraction here and a subtraction there. And I prefer to use these kind of notch filters here to find the ugly stuff, those really strong frequencies and just dip them out a bit. Last but not least, we have step six, which is vocal automation. I'm gonna to have to open up a different mix for that because we don't have a lead vocal part here. This track is slightly different. It's gonna sound horrific because no mixing has happened at this point. I've literally just imported the files, but have a quick listen so you can get an idea of the style. So kind of indie folk, very vocal focus. So with these kind of tracks, whether it's like this or whether it's more electronic pop, any genre where it's really the key element, I think it's worth going through and actually automating it now as part of the prep phase so that when it comes to mixing, the vocal's already super consistent and you can just focus on EQ, compression, that kind of stuff without having to spend loads of time automating the vocal. It's not perfect because it is often nice to have the context when you're automating the vocal to know which words are gonna get lost in the mix, but I still think there's more benefits to doing it now as part of the prep phase and then you can go back and tweak it later on. So what I used to do was literally go to the vocal and look at every single word word, bring up the quiet words, bring down the loud words so that it was just uber consistent. So we can just get a rough idea. We need to actually listen to this, but you can just see from the waveforms already which words are going to be too loud and which are going to be too quiet. Make sure you're doing this in solo and you could just go through and do it this way. To say the things that might just help me understand. To say the things that might. So it kind of gets lost there. To say the things that might just help me understand gets a bit loud there to say the things that might just help me understand you to say the things that might just help me understand a bit lost there to say the things that might just help me understand you if you have the time to go into this much detail, then I do recommend it because it will have a huge impact on the end result. Having said that, what I find myself doing more commonly now is using a plugin like Waves Vocal Rider that basically does this for you and then you can tweak it afterwards. So if we get rid of all that automation um, and then we can just use Vocal Rider and tweak the settings now again in the prep phase, write it to the channel so that when we're mixing, we don't have to worry about this. Now that we've tweaked the settings a little bit, we can set this to right, set the channel to right, and actually get this onto the channel itself. And now what we can do is actually tweak this. So I can go through, just listen, and catch these bits where it does it a bit too much and manually edit it. So that's step six, automating the vocal so that when it comes to mixing, it's already consistent, it already sounds great. It's gonna be easier to balance and then easier to compress EQ, etc. So there you go, six mix prep steps. It's better to mix fast and preparing the mix extensively like this really helps with that. So if you actually wanna go and implement this, I highly recommend you get the cheat sheet that will walk you through each of these steps. You can use it as a checklist to make sure you're covering all of this, not missing anything, and it's completely free. So just head Head to the link on screen now or in the description to go and download that. And if you're new around here, don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. So that's all from me. I'm Rob from Musician on a Mission and remember, create regardless.